I'm Tim Barber. I'm one of the co-founders of Canada 2020. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here with you. Uh, I want to thank our co-chairs again, uh, Deb Matthews and Wayne Wouters. I want to thank Jordy at uh, Publivate, who's been a great partner. I want to thank Don Blenahan, who I have known now for 25 years, which really dates me. We first met back at uh, a little operation called the Federal Provincial Relations Office, which was part of the Privy Council Office during the Constitutional Wars back in the early 1990s. Uh, in 2007, we published a little book called Progressive Governance for Canadians. Uh, this can be found on remainder shelves, including our office shelves. Uh, and I'm going to bring copies of this because there are many of them at our office. But I just wanted to say that uh, Don wrote most of this. Uh, and it was myself on a working committee with Graham Fox, who's now at IRPP, and John Malloy, who has gone off, is now teaching at a combination of uh, Wilfrid Laurier and Waterloo and doing a number of things. Despite being associated with radical thoughts in this book, John went on to be a mem member of the uh, McGuinty cabinet and, and the, worked in the Wynne government as uh, house leader. He's now retired from politics as a member, uh, sorry, member of provincial parliament for Kitchener Centre. But this, uh, I, I hold this up as an example of this isn't something that Don started uh, you know, last year or last month. This has been a long time commitment and uh, uh, it's nice to see how quickly things have advanced. Uh, that said, um, I was listening to that skeptical question asked over Twitter about uh, why does this matter? And I reflected back on a conference that we did in 2007, which was based on the book. And I was sitting on a panel and somebody got up and asked the question, which was not dissimilar from the one uh, sent in from Twitter, of does any of this lead to better public policy? And that's a really important question I think we have to keep our, our eyes on. Another important uh, thing that I think we have to keep our eyes on, I was speaking to Joe Thornley uh, briefly uh, before this panel, is that are we setting ourselves up in the sense that, uh, and I'll get, use the example of the recent budget with Minister Morneau, if you ask people a question on, we really want your input on this budget going forward, you know, I'm told upwards of 10,000 people have responded and sent in their ideas, some of which are, are great, some of which are uh, you know, obvious. Uh, but I, I do think that if we're going to ask people for input, we actually have to be able to show, they have to see a reflection of themselves in the output. And I think we always have to think about that. So, with that a quick little intro, um, I am going to invite, um, I'm delighted to have uh, three very uh, important people on this panel, uh, Edwin Lau, Kevin Chan, Rodney McDonald, uh, on this panel, what digital tools can do for open dialogue. Uh, first up is going to be Edwin, uh, who's with the OECD, then Kevin uh, from Facebook, and Rodney from Intuit, and we're absolutely thrilled to have all three uh, after their talks. Uh, which will be from the podium. Uh, we are going to uh, ask for audience questions, so please uh, get ready to come up to the mics. Thanks very much. Edwin. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, there's a click. Oh, here it is. All right. Uh, so first of all, I just wanted to say how happy I am to be in Canada. It's been 10 years since I was last in Ottawa. And I just love to come to this country, uh, où je peux parler français ou anglais, les deux langues que j'aime tant, and then switch halfway through the sentence. You know, that's something that uh, I'm, a, I'm a real wannabe Canadian. But uh, uh, I'm here because the OECD has done uh, a, a lot of work for a very long time on open government, but we've also seen it. That's allowed us to see how it has evolved over time. And some of you may be aware of the seminal work that we did on open government and citizens as partners maybe 15 years ago. And, and Don was, was part of that. And, and we've really benefited a lot from that conversation between what is going on in Canada and what is happening in the other countries of the OECD. Now, over, since that time, you know, the, the topic has sort of waxed and waned a little bit. And, but now it's come back. And what we're thinking about is not so much you know, what are the tools for open government, but really what is the impact on government and how it's changing the way that government works. So I'm, I'm not a technology evangelist. Uh, I'm really here more to say, what about the rest of the public administration? What are implications for structures, for ways of working? And perhaps to answer some of the questions that we had in the first session about why is it that civil servants are sometimes a bit reluctant to take on some of these new tools? Um, so, here we go. So I start off with why open dialogue? 
uh, then I'll go on to what, what is the difference, what does the digital dimension add or, or change to how we do open dialogue? And then some of the, the work that we've done at the OECD that can help digital tools better support open dialogue. So I think the first thing is, as long as we think about open dialogue as a layer between government and citizens, it's never going to go very far. Uh, when, when going back 10, 12 years ago, I was at a meeting look, talking about portals, and one of the delegates from France said, portals are fantastic because it means we don't have to reform governments. We just sort of reshuffle things and then we, we have a nice interface with citizens and we don't have to change the back office. And I think that showed, revealed a lot of what people's thinking are about how digital tools work. What we've seen is that by involving citizens in the discussion about what the policy issues should be, you see this is a good example of technology, um, that we see that the, the, the discourse is actually changing. And nowhere do I see this more importantly than within my own organization, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. You notice it's, it's about economics. And yet at the same time, we will have a ministerial meeting in June, and the Chilean government, which is the chair of that ministerial, has said the most important topics for us are productivity and inclusive growth. I don't know about you, but you get a bunch of economists together and you want them talking about inclusive growth, it's a real, real sea change. But this is partly the result of dialogue that's going on in all of our member countries where people are saying the gap between the haves and the have-nots is widening and there is a real danger for both economic growth and democracy inherent in this. So we see openness and engagement not as an end in and of itself, but really something that is driving the political agenda that is about better policies and better services as we discussed uh, earlier this morning, but also about inclusive growth, trust in government, and well-being of its citizens. You can see across OECD countries, this shows uh, uh, Gallup poll data on trust in government between uh, 2007 and 2014, and the, the dotted line on the bottom that shows the percent change. So there's been a real plummet uh, in the post-global crisis in terms of levels of trust in government. We know this is tied to a, a number of factors. I mean, one thing that's also very interesting is the BRIC countries are on the right-hand side, and there, trust has actually improved in a lot of those countries. So it's not just about how you do things, it's also about your ultimate performance. But we also realize that citizens increasingly are looking at things that go beyond economic growth. So. If, you, if you've never looked at it, you should Google the OECD Better Life uh, Index. And what this does is it lets you look at 11 different areas, such as education, housing, uh, 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 civic engagement is one of them. Uh, and you can build your own index based on where, what you value the most. So some people might put growth and income very high, jobs very high. Others might privilege more employment or quality of life. And what we actually do is we are able to collect that information in terms of what people's search preferences are to, to build a map that looks at what are, what are people valuing, not just the data itself, but really what people's interests and values lie. Uh, I think this is one of the areas where we're starting to get a better picture of where our citizens' uh, uh, preferences, motivations sit, and that's a real tool uh, to inform government policymaking. Um, I really want you to look at this. When you look, look at it closely, you'll see that it's not perfect. In particular, our civic engagement measures are horrible because they're voter participation and their consultation in regulatory decision making. You know, that is just a sliver of what civic engagement is, but it's a starting point, and we're hoping that this gets the discussion going about how we can better measure levels of civic engagement and open uh, dialogue. Uh, Open dialogue is also not just about policy making, but it's about improving outcomes. If you look at the OECD Observatory for Public Sector Innovation, we just recently had a blog which looks at all the different stages in which citizens can be engaged in the production of public value. And the, there's 50 odd examples that we've developed with Governance International, and we've seen that some of these examples uh, really show that by involving citizens, you can really achieve outcomes that were unimaginable before. So for example, the, the Council of Sussex in the UK uh, found that by involving youth in their, um, uh, in their training and education programs, they're able to have the number of meets. These are uh, youth who are neither in education, employment, or training uh, by half in a two-year period of time. 
We also have examples of um, uh, in Italy where they use uh, uh, citizens to report back on uh, uh, urban infrastructure. We have cases in uh, Austria and in the UK as well uh, where citizens are engaged not just in the delivery of services but really in setting that agenda. So we see that effective engagement has, has, has led to this, this improvement in services, not all the time, but that it, that it can support it. Uh, because this is about aligning the needs um, or services with the needs and expectations of the citizens. Um, the, a good example of this is uh, the National Institute for, for Social Security in Italy, uh, where they have mobile counters. You know, I think a lot of our concern is that when you add the digital dimension, that you also create new uh, groups of exclusion. Uh, but what we found is that, especially with the mobile revolution and, internet and high levels of smartphone penetration, that at least within our OECD countries, that we're able to get around a lot of these, uh, these social economic uh, challenges to uh, accessing digital services. Uh, we've also seen the redesign of, of improved services based on the, the user experience. And I found the, this morning's discussion with Minister Bryson to be really interesting because what he was saying is, by opening government, you're really challenging uh, the, the way in which government works. And so I've written de-siloization into my, into my notebook. Because when you ask government to reform itself, it's going to use its own logic, it's going to use its own thinking, and people are immediately going to say, how do I protect my interests? How do I protect my organization? And so you're never going to get that truly citizen uh, focus. Government says that it's, it, it wants to be citizen focused, but it can never really anticipate you can only get that citizen focus by giving the, the, putting the citizens in the driver's seat. That means giving them the information, giving them the data to be able to make those decisions with governments. And I think that that's where we see that the redesign of government uh, is quite challenging and difficult for uh, civil servants to respond to because it creates, they, they're, they're no longer in the driver's seat, they're losing control. And that's why it's very important for our political uh, uh, level to give the green light to send the signals that this is something that's valued and something that is going to become part of how government works going into the future. So increasingly, we're seeing that government is evolving from being a, a, a provider or a provider-beneficiary relationship to this partnership relationship. And uh, I think if you look on, on our Observatory for Public Sector Innovation, you'll see lots and lots of cases of how this is happening in different countries. But we still see that many challenges uh, uh, persist. Uh, the first is that the focus still tends to be very much on transparency uh, rather than on engagement. Uh, we recently did a, a survey on, on open government uh, uh, policies, and 80% of countries said that open government for them was transparency. Only 33% said that this was about stakeholder engagement. Um, if we also see that, um, I think 50, it was 80% transparency, 50% said it's consultation, one-way consultation, uh, and only 33% said th this two-way engagement. So this shows that governments really still have quite a long way to go in terms of their thinking through all the different stages of open government. What we're also seeing is that while, sit, while governments uh, recognize the importance of consultation, they're doing it at a very late stage when a lot of the decisions have already been taken, and so then they're just looking for that rubber stamp from the citizens. Um, uh, data collection that we've done on regulatory practices across OECD countries. I think in 2009, we said that uh, 24 out of the 34 OECD countries were doing some type of regulatory consultation. By 2014, it had risen up to 29 countries, yet most of those countries still do it at the tail end of the regulatory process. Very few do it very early on to ask citizens to help them to set the regulatory agenda. And then we see also, some challenges about how do we go beyond our usual suspects, and we think of these, the people who are able and willing to participate in engagement. You know, I, I have two young kids. I spend probably 50 hours in the office uh, a week, and then if you add the time on my BlackBerry, that's another 10, 15 hours. I don't have time to do a lot of social media. I don't have a lot of time to respond to consultations, and I think that most citizens are, feel that way too. So this is not about do you believe in consultation, do you not believe in consultation? It's what is the value proposition? And so what we're going to see is that if we're able to align the interest area, the topics with what citizens want, then they will engage using those tools. It's not whether those tools are good or bad in and of themselves. And I think that's the real challenge for government. 
yes, evaluation. I, I just wanted to mention that uh, when we asked governments in 2009 whether they were doing evaluation, 11% said that they don't do any evaluation of their, of their um, engagement initiatives. 50% said that they did, oh, I'm going, they do some, but not, not, um, but not, but not all. Uh, that number has slowly crept up, but what we're seeing is that most evaluation of engagement is still about describing what is being done. It's the process. Uh, how many engagement processes have I done? How many people responded? Uh, uh, what were the, the comments, categorizing those comments? They're not looking at impact, and they're not looking at whether or not there is an impact on decision making. It's not an easy answer, uh, question to respond to, but we think that it's critical to be able to show the, 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 the business case for uh, open, part, open uh, dialogue. So then I said that I would get to the digital dimension, and uh, at the OECD, we have a project on digital government. It looks at how, what are the implications of digital government. Um, and I, I don't think I even need to go through this list because you've heard it so many times. Transparency, cost effectiveness. But I think that what's important is that we look not just at what are the benefits for government, because yes, you know, in terms of value for money, that's important, but also what are the benefits for the citizens in terms of the convenience, the accessibility. We worked with Denmark, for example, on uh, some digital welfare tools that they're using to help bring services to citizens. And the Danish government, uh, the e-government e initiative is run out of the Ministry of Finance, and so they're able to just give you all the numbers in terms of the savings that this has for government. But we said to them, think about what the benefits are for the elderly, for example, because one of their target groups is diabetic elderly that live in rural areas and no longer have to travel to their regional hospital to get the services. This has real tangible benefits that can be translated into improved levels of trust in government and in increased levels of support for government policies. And he said, yeah, that's, you know, so there are both quantitative as well as some qualitative benefits that need to go into the ledger. Uh, we see the importance of data to, to identify social, social trends. I talked a little bit earlier about how we can better use data to, to understand what citizens' needs and preferences are, but we also need to use uh, better analytics tools to understand what that data means and what are the implications for government. And finally, when we look at the, the, the three pillars of open government, I think that the information pillar, sometimes people say, oh, well, you know, that's just, we just get the information out. But it's critical that that information allows us to inform the policy dialogue. And, you know, as an American, I know the importance of uh, informed civic engagement, believe me. Yeah. So, okay, thank you. Um, in terms of some of the experiences that we've seen, uh, uh, we, we know that the sharing, consultation, deliberation, and collaboration are, are four of the elements of, of uh, uh, open government. Uh, some examples here, we have the, the min pension, which is the social security system in Sweden, which allows citizens to be updated not just on what policy proposals are in social security, but also what it, impact it has on their own personal social security accounts. For consultation, the Urna de Cristal is an initiative in Colombia where it's been very critical to improve the levels of trust in government because it provides a forum for people to discuss uh, policy issues. The Manabals, it means my voice in Latvian, uh, uh, which allows actually people to deliver uh, citizen initiatives and if they can get 10,000 votes, it goes, it goes to the parliament, uh, so it's a referendum system. Uh, and, then, and then also for collaboration, the National Institute for Health and Welfare is in Finland and a challenge that Gov, many of you may know, but are good examples of crowdsourcing uh, uh, solutions uh, with citizens and government as partners. So I'm going to go um, s get through my last couple of slides. What we see is that open data is actually a good conversation starter. It's a way to get people thinking about what is the impact of policies for my personal life. But in fact, if you look in the, the red, area, we see that very few governments think of open data as being uh, a tool for open dialogue. Then we also see that when we, we look, we, we've done a working paper on the use of social media by governments, and the, the results of that were that governments still think of social media primarily as a one-way communications channel and not as a tool for two-way dialogue. So. I, I saved the best for last. The OECD in 2014. Uh, had a recommendation on digital government strategies. It falls into three pillars. 
One is on openness and engagement, the second is on governance and, and co coordination, and the third is on capacities to support implementation. So Canada has signed off on this at a very high level, but now we're working on how do you implement and how do you monitor that. But basically the insight here is that uh, diffusion of dig digitization, digitization in and of itself does not lead to greater openness and transparency. You have to embed the values into how you, you uh, deploy ICT. And so therefore, governments should be held accountable and they should include this as part of the strategy of ICT. So as I mentioned, there's a, a digital government toolkit. Once a year, we have all of the government CIOs from the 34 OECD countries that meet. So they met in September in Tokyo last year. We had a good discussion about this. Because of the elections, Canada was not at the table. Uh, but we'll be meeting in uh, Estonia this year, and we really want to be able to bring a lot more Canadian experiences to that discussion about how we can embed these values uh, of openness, transparency, and dialogue into our values uh, for digital government. And then I will close with our, our data index, which looks at the level of uh, openness. This is based on the Open Data Charter, uh, and it focuses not just on how much data is made available, but what countries are using to promote the reuse of data. Um, I hope you can all get my slides because then you can see all the things that I have to say that I haven't been able to get into. But, um, we'll make them available. yeah, and on this, this last page, there are hyperlinks to all of these pages of different work that the OECD has done in the area of open data and open government. So thank you very much. Kevin. Thanks, Edwin. Next up, Kevin Chan from <coughs> Facebook. Uh, Estonia in September. Kevin, over to you. Uh, merci beaucoup. Je m'appelle uh, Kevin Chan. Je suis le directeur des politiques publiques uh, à Facebook Canada. Um, and it's great to be here with you all today. Um, so I'm going to talk, and I like that intro from Edwin. I'm going to talk a bit about, so indeed, how we think social media um, and, part and is part of work, first of all, right? Um, and can be helpful, uh, we think, um, to, to government uh, engaging with Canadians. Uh, so that's me, uh, in the sense that that's me that you'll find if you look for me on Facebook. Um, so that's my authentic identity, is what we call it. So people on Facebook tend to be their, their, their true selves. Um, and we think that that kind of opens up enormous potential uh, for governments to actually be able to engage with not just hundreds or thousands of people, but millions of people at a time um, through engagement processes. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of things. Um, you, know, you can see them here. Some of the partnerships that we've done with government on Amber Alerts, uh, on uh, the election, uh, with Elections Canada specifically. Um, and then we're going to talk a bit about some examples, some recent examples about how uh, the government of Canada has tried to engage Canadians uh, online. And I think you can largely think about them as two things, right? So like one is a bucket of activities uh, where you're leveraging digital to achieve certain public policy or programmatic outcomes. Um, and the second one is just literally how are you going out there and you're engaging and consulting with Canadians directly online and not just, as Edwin was saying, not just sort of as a one-way thing, but as an iterative thing where you're actually taking comments back and engaging with Canadians um, by taking what they're saying and coming back to them with something else. Um, so just an overview here. So Facebook, there are 1.6 billion people uh, globally on Facebook. That's ex-China. We're not in China. So that's a you know, significant number of, of, of the population. Um, and in Canada, we're talking about 21 million monthly active users. So that is about 73, I think, percent of Canadians who are connected to the internet. Um, and um, I think that when you look at numbers of this scale on a platform, that allows for some incredible potential uh, for engagement with Canadians. First thing I want to talk about, Facebook Amber Alerts. Um, so this is, this is baby Victoria. Um, and I want to talk a bit about how her story inspired what we did um, later on on the platform to build some engagement tools uh, directly into it. So Baby Victoria, you may have heard this story, is about, I think, two years ago, um, she was born in Trois-Rivières. Um, and then uh, like within an hour of her being born, uh, she was kidnapped from the, from the maternity ward. Um, and then, of course, the mother was kind of like, you know, like, oh, my God, I can't believe this happened. This is like something like in a movie. Um, and, and the story is like, so her, 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 um, her father posted uh, you know, on Facebook um, that her daughter had been kidnapped. Um, and it kind of went viral um, in the community. Uh, and three teenagers who actually didn't know, um, you know the, the family at all said, well, you know what, we're in Trois-Rivières. We're going to go find this, this person. And they went looking around. 
um, in just the neighborhood in people's homes, um, and they actually, you know, crazy story, but they actually found her, uh, the baby, um, with, with the kidnapper, and thankfully she was safe, and, and, and within, I think, the, within a few hours, the baby was returned, uh, saying so to, 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 uh, to the parents who were still at the hospital. Um, so, so we looked at this and we said, well, wow, you know, this is incredible. This is a way that people are using um, uh, the platform to engage um, and do something of, of public good. What can we do about it? Um, and so we decided to partner with the RCMP uh, and with uh, provincial police to bring Amber Alerts uh, to, to Facebook. Um, and, and the way it, it works is sort of when an Amber Alert goes out from the authorizing authority, uh, the, the authorizing authority, it actually, um, uh, we get an email notification, and then we send it out or we beam it out to people just within a certain radius of where the baby was last seen. And so that's a way for us to send a message directly uh, to the people who are relevant in this case, people who are actually going to be in a position to help. This is kind of what it looks like. Uh, it's, it's mobile only, because again, people uh, tend to check uh, on Facebook 14 times a day uh, on their mobile phones. And so this is, this is sort of what they would see. When they're mobile, they're actually more likely to be able to move around and talk to other people and, and, and do something to help. Um, so in Canada, if you ever see this, that's because you are actually in the zone, uh, the, the zone of search. Um, and uh, you know, we, we, we obviously hope that, uh, that that'll help uh, with a safe recovery of, of babies and children. Next thing I want to talk about is Facebook's um, work during the election campaign. Um, you guys have probably seen a lot of this stuff uh, already. Uh, this is just a little bit of a collage of the various things we did with all three parties and with various media partners uh, throughout um, the campaign. And um, I wanted to sort of run through a few examples to show some of the, some of the, some of the possibilities that the political parties um, have, have engaged with. So the first is you know, um, you know, open, uh, direct, and live uh, uh, connections with Canadians. And so um, obviously, you need to start with the prime minister. Um, he launched his platform live uh, on Facebook. Um, and this was you know, a couple of months ago. And in, you know, in Facebook time, that's like an eternity. So, so, so the platform was actually quite new, this live platform. It actually hadn't really been, uh, been used much. Um, so this was pretty neat. It was like a global first for a political leader uh, to do something like this. And again, it was a way to bring Canadians uh, directly into the conversation. And what was neat was, you know, um, you know, Mr. Trudeau was actually, so I was with him in Waterloo at Wilfrid Laurier University. He was actually like in the back room uh, when, when he turned the live on. And so he kind of welcomed, he sort of talked to the audience directly uh, on Facebook and said, hey, I have something to share with you today. Walk with me, I'll take you on stage, and I'm going to announce our platform. So he kind of walked in, it was like a big sort of crowd, big rally, um, the media were there, um, but he had kind of taken that extra moment and positioned it as something that he was sharing uh, with his audience, uh, which at the time I think was like, I don't know, maybe like 300, 400,000, it's now like 1.5 or 1.6 million. Um, but that was a really a creative way um, to do that. Um, obviously, other uh, political leaders did Q&As, and, and I want to just point out that there are some serious topics that were discussed as well. So uh, the previous Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, he actually, during the campaign on the day the TPP was announced globally, uh, he went on Facebook uh, to do a live Q&A uh, with his supporters, specifically on the Trans-Pacific Partnership during the campaign, which we thought was a pretty, pretty neat way to do that and speak directly to Canadians. Um, we partnered with uh, various leaders debates, the McLean's Monk ones, as well as media partnerships with CTV News and Radio Canada. And there I'll just point out, you know, we were able to provide additional data insights into what Canadians were actually talking about. So like if you were like most Canadians, you're going to go home at night, you could turn on the TV, you know, once you put the kids to bed, um, and then you're watching TV and you have your second screen, right? Um, and you're probably on your tablet or your mobile phone or your laptop, and you're probably online on social media platforms. Um, and so this was a way for us to understand, you know, as you're watching the debate, what are, your, you know, what, what, are you, what are you engaging on? What are you engaging with? Um, and, you know, one of the interesting insights that came out of this was so from June 1 to October 19, uh, October 19 7 million Canadians talked about um, the election uh, on Facebook. And this is unprompted, and this is not ads, it's just people talking about it. Um, and what's neat is that that actually um, shows that, you know, while the pundits were saying, oh, it's the summer, you know, no, nobody cares, no one's watching, it turned out, I think, like, by, by the first debate, there was, like, some, something like three million Canadians were talking about the Canadian election. So I think that kind of suggested that there was actually something happening beneath the surface that you actually couldn't see, um, or that it would sort of run counter to, you know, popular wisdom. 
Um, and this is some of the, some of the um, data that you can see. You know, we, we tried to track economic and social issues. This is, again, unprompted, just people talking about this in, in an aggregate way. And you can see that there were two times during the course of the election where social issues actually um, took over from the economic ones. One was on the refugee crisis, um, and, that was, and the second one was when, when the terrorist um, citizenship uh, was, was revoked. But the trend lines were clear. You know, the economic issues clearly dominated during the campaign. Um, elections Canada, you know, just to finish off, and, you know, on, on the election stuff, another partnership we did, uh, interesting with the with 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 the independent agency, uh, we did two two things. One was a voter registration drive. So it was the first time that they actually had an online registration tool. So on International Day of Democracy, uh, though September 15, um, we we did this very prominent news feed story. Uh, it's kind of like a public service announcement. We partnered with Elections Canada, and we we put this uh, in front of all Canadians on Facebook that day, 18 and above. Um, and on that day, according to Elections Canada's data anyways, um, they had 44,000, uh, uh, close to 44.5 thousand people uh, go to their site and, and either register or update their information. Um, that was their single biggest uh, day for registration since they opened the tool up, I think, in 20, I think it was 14 or 2013. Um, and similarly, on Election Day, uh, we activate what we call the voter megaphone. Uh, where again, uh, you know, it was very prominent button plates at the top of everybody's news feeds, again, driving people who are 18 and above uh, to, well, reminding them that there's an election, it's a little bit of a nudge, right? Reminding them that it's an election uh, and they should go vote. Um, and if they needed to learn more about it, there actually was a button where they can click through and it would take them directly to Elections Canada where they could kind of look up their, their polling booth. Um, and on that day, we we're really proud to say uh, we reached 12.4 million Canadians. Uh, and they shared this 814,000 times uh, on our platform. So what does government digital engagement look like now after the campaign? So I'm just gonna run through just a few examples. You know, Minister Morneau um, did some pre-budget consultations uh, live on Facebook, uh, which we thought was pretty cool. It's a nice way for him to, to engage directly with Canadians. Uh, Prime Minister's state visit, uh, he uh, was able to take Canadians along and show them some images in, in a way uh, that felt authentic, uh, that felt direct in a way that they wouldn't normally see or expect. Um, and recently, uh, Minister Chagger uh, was at a Facebook event and she went live moderating a panel on small business. And this was again a way to show um, that here is this Minister of the Crown who's assigned to small business, but she actually cares, she wants to engage with small businesses, and she's actually kind of quite conversant on these issues. Uh, and, you know, and of course, this continues in politics. Uh, we had um, Leader of the Opposition, Rona Ambrose, actually deliver her uh, response uh, to the budget live uh, on Facebook. Um, at the Manning Conference uh, recently, there was a lot of programming uh, where they had supplemental insights uh, on, on Facebook Live. And again, it was a way, obviously, to engage uh, with a much broader audience um, that, that wasn't actually um, uh, at, the, at the conference itself. So, so what's next? So, so by some counts, but I think this is, this is wrong, I think it's much higher than this. The, the government has launched over 20 policy initiatives uh, involving some form of consultation with Canadians. Um, and there's now a new way to consult Canadians online and at scale. It doesn't have to be Facebook. It could be kind of like, like you know, any platform or all these platforms. But this is really exciting uh, because it's a way for you to reach directly to Canadians. And again, not just you know, hundreds or thousands. We're talking about millions of Canadians. Um, it's going to look and feel uh, and be different. Um, so I think digital platforms will complement uh, rather than replace existing mechanisms. Uh, but I think people will have to feel comfortable with the nature and type of input that you're going to get from Canadians. And so, you know, like, I think, I think a lot of times people are saying, oh, well, you know, like, we're not really sure. Like, we're, we're used to, like, sort of documents are submitted, and they're kind of well, you know, well analyzed and well written, and, and, and you know, there's three or four pages, and they come from trade associations, or, or they come from other um, stakeholder groups, traditional stakeholder groups. And, and, and I think, you know, people and governments will have to get used to this idea that actually people, uh, you know, do care. Um, and while they may not have sort of all the policy expertise, um, and, and the training, um, their, their views are actually um, you know, really valid. And, and, and it's something that I think politicians actually understand um, viscerally already, right? And when they walk into a room and they hear stuff from, from, from people in the room, uh, it's, not, it's qualitative, um, it's not sort of you know, synthesized, um, but that is a signal check. Um, and so I think that's important. And if you look at some, some of the American stuff happening in the States, you know, if you look at, if you look at Donald Trump, um, and, you know, and this is not, you know, this is not a comment on sort of, you know, what my thoughts are, and, and who cares what, I, what my thoughts are on this. Um, but, but, if, but if you look at it, you know, back in the summer, people were like, oh man, this is like a fad, this is, this is not gonna last. 
Um, but I think if you look at sort of his presence online and the way people were engaging with him um, digitally, uh, I, mean, I think it's perhaps not a surprise uh, to see where he is today. So, you know, again, I would not discount the nature of this stuff. The challenge would be to figure out, you know, well, then how does one incorporate um, all of this kind of input um, into meaningful uh, government analysis um, and, 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 and public policy outcomes? Um, and I am hopeful that I think this stuff will lead to a more open, democratic, um, and, 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 and reflect, oops, and, and, and um, views that are reflective of the diversity of Canadians. Um, and the last thing, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of my colleagues uh, who will be here throughout the conference will say, is we, we want to help. Um, so we want to be able to help you think through these things. We think about these things globally. Um, we have teams purely dedicated to civic engagement and building out products um, that, uh, that deal just with this question. If you look at The Economist, uh, you know, I think it was like uh, this week or last week's report, a uh, special report just on digital social media and politics. Um, and I think engagement is kind of the next round of this. So it's interesting, how do you engage with supporters? But the next thing is, well, how do you, how do you actually take this stuff and do something interesting from a substantive public policy? Uh, point of view. Um, so I, I look forward to the conversation uh, both today and, and beyond. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, next up is Rodney McDonald from Intuit. Je... Je pense que je devrais commencer en français pour, pour donner à Edwin une belle expérience canadienne. Alors, le voilà. Okay. Um, well, listen, Intuit, uh, for those of you who don't know, is we're a software company. We're increasingly a cloud-based uh, company. And I'm sure that, you know, the one thing on your minds in the next four weeks is filing your taxes, right? Right? You're all doing this on the weekend. You're trying to make sure the bank has sent you your interest statement and your RESP statement. So. What we're all about is trying to make that process easier. Um, so we're actually a global company, um, and we are primarily in North America uh, for our tax product. Um, and I'm not going to get into why that is. The tax systems in most other um, G8 nations are very different. Um, and you know, we also provide QuickBooks, which is the small business accounting software. Uh, and that, that's actually a much more global product uh, in Australia, New Zealand, France, uh, the UK, uh, many other locales, India. Um, so our offices in Canada are in Edmonton, Mississauga. Uh, we employ about 500 uh, developers and tax advisors. And, um, you know, we provide QuickBooks, Empoapid, uh, TurboTax in Canada. And, um, you know, our TurboTax product is actually used by um, over 10, to file over 10 million tax returns in Canada every year. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit of the story of how this came about. How is it that there is a private sector software product which most Canadians use between our product and our competitors' products to fulfill their annual tax obligation? So, you know, we're here today to talk about open government. and you know, between us and our competitor products, I, I really think we are one of the most concrete examples of digital tools building on government data and providing a service that consumers, i.e. taxpayers in, in the TurboTax example, are using. Um, sometimes they're using it for a fee, um, sometimes they're using it for free, and I'll get into a, a bit about how how it came to be that you, you can choose a $20 product, you can choose a $40 product, or you can choose a myriad of free products, uh, which we even provide as well. So in order to explain um, how this came about, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw on the example of Apple, um, which, as we all know, makes some of the, the best mobile devices in the world. And they have hundreds of millions of customers um, for whom their iPhone is you know, arguably the center of their life. Hasn't happened for my kids yet. We don't let them have one. Uh, they're too little. They just break it. So, you know, pretty early on, Apple realized that the iPhone, uh, in order for it to become the device of millions of people, there needed to be a way for customers to personalize their experiences on the device. 
And you know, Apple uh, realized that they couldn't possibly offer every service that consumers were going to demand, nor could they even imagine what that would be. Uh, so they opened up some of the core functionality of the, of the iPhone, as you all know, like the ability to tell where the device was, where it's being used, um, open up, you know, the, get access to the photos you're taking. And it allowed developers to innovate and create new services while providing an app store so that consumers could find those applications. Um, little side note, you know, I just recently bought a little piece of forest and you know, I'm using an app to compare the length of driveways of my neighbors um, to determine how long I want my driveway to be. So that's, you know, that's a real example that I'm using on my phone. Um, so the App Store, the Apple App Store opened in 2008, and if we scroll forward to today, you know, there's over one and a half million apps with, which have been downloaded over 100 billion times. So you know, I think probably job well done with this idea, you know, from Apple and others. And even more significantly, apps like, you know, Facebook, Uber, Instagram, Twitter, um, have become integral to people's lives. I mean, to say the very least. Um, so you might be asking, what on earth does this have to do with the Canadian government? What does this have to do with our tax agency, the CRA? Um, and probably a lot more than many of you may realize. The CRA embarked on a similar journey uh, to Apple, although one which obviously has probably attracted fewer magazine covers and uh, uh, headlines in general. The agency is on a multi-year journey to move from a tax system dominated by paper uh, to one that is primarily electronic. And so at Intuit, we believe the best way for CRA to achieve this objective is through collaborating with um, our industry and so that our products can become the interface between Canadians and the CRA. That's not to say that Canadians don't just love picking up the phone and having to call the CRA and you know, dealing with them directly and it, trying to interpret their mail, um, but it, it would seem that the development of our software has, Canadians are quite eager um, to deal with our software instead of directly dealing with the CRA. By the lack of reaction, I'm guessing none of you have ever called CRA during tax season. So, you know, to be fair, like we're not fully there yet. Um, who here has used ta TurboTax? I want hands. A lot of people. Emporepid, if you're a francophone? Okay. So, you know, the, the CRA still handles uh, tens of thousands of calls. Um, of people who aren't able to get the answer they need either from our product or from the CRA website. Um, you know, into it, we, we were comparing notes with our CRA stakeholders, and during tax season, we handle about 10,000 calls a week. During tax season, uh, CRA handles about 20,000 calls a day. So, you know, you, you can just imagine the scale of administration that's required for that agency to, to fulfill um, the expectation of getting answers for Canadians. Um, and, you know, they're also sending out billions of dollars by check, by mail. So over the past few years, uh, millions of Canadians have migrated to direct deposit, but there's this final long tail of, of Canadians who just, for whatever barriers, have not signed up for direct deposit. So I'm here to plug for the CRA, sign up for direct deposit. Um, so, you know, and, and the CRA is making big strides, which I want to talk about. You know, they, they've created a My Account, which is a very secure online uh, mailbox where they can give you your NOA, give you updates, ask for further information. Um, and this has been achieved in large part, you know, much like Apple, because the CRA is increasingly viewing itself as a platform. It's invested in understanding how to stimulate innovation around it, and it's focusing its resources on the core services it, know it, it knows it needs to deliver, that the software industry can't do for it. So, you know, like Apple, CRA opened up services for developers to access. So at CRA, this is called the NetFile and eFile service. The NetFile is what our software partners with so that consumers can 
submit their tax returns directly to the CRA. E-file is what accountants use. And this year they also created Autofill My Return, which is the connection between the slip data that they have, your, your RESP slips, your T4s, um, you know, whatever automatic employer slips that go to the CRA can now be directly downloaded um, from your My Account into TurboTax so that when you go to use TurboTax, if you don't make any mistakes, half of your data should already be there. And it's, it's advancing uh, the, the ease of f filing your taxes in, in, in great strides. Um, so this new autofill my return functionality is it's really a significant evolution that's been implemented into I think I believe all of the certified software products uh, like ours that are available to Canadians and You know, it's really making it so that most of the work will already be done for you now This is a significant significant step forward um, but where we believe we can take the product experience by greater access to CRA data uh, is within the short term, like within two, three, four years, is, is, is gonna be radically different. So at Intuit, we're calling this the taxes are done. And this is our driving philosophy. We want so that when it comes to tax time, you know, instead of thinking about taxes for two days a year or when I plug you at a conference, um, so that it, you, I, either you don't have to think about it at all until the moment you realize, oh, I want to submit to the CRA, or um, the, the tax return becomes so linked into your financial life that at the end of the year, our product, which through your permission has access to your financial expenditures throughout the year, can say, oh, Mr. Barber, you know, we noticed that you rented a U-Haul. Did you move? Did you move more than 40 kilometers? If so, oh, actually, we know you moved more than 40 kilometers because we have your new address. So therefore, you know, that U-Haul you rented is, is an expense that you can claim, and we've already calculated that into your deduction. Um, this is not far off. Um, and in order, what we need to get there is, is a two-way dialogue with the CRA data. So Edwin mentioned that in most countries, governments are still viewing the, um, the interaction between government data or government services to citizens as a one-way dialogue. And that is not gonna be the model of the future. It's gonna, we're gonna need two-way access. We're gonna, in, in, in our case, need updates from the CRA. You know, CRA pings us and says, oh, you know what, we need physical copies or pictures of your transit receipts you know, said client can then snap a photo of their transit receipts, upload that to TurboTax, and it goes straight back to the CRA. No mail involved, no scary letter that makes you think, oh God, I probably owe them 600 bucks for something. I'm not making that up. Um, so, you know, the CRA has also created an app store of sorts um, where you can go on their, one of their websites and basically see all of the products like ours, our free product, our paid product, our competitor products, who's, who shall remain unnamed. Um, and you can, you can basically choose secure, certified products, which the CRA has certified themselves, saying, if you use these software products, we are confident that you will not get audited this year, if you are honest. Um, so, and they, they've also thought of ways to manipulate the market. So um, the CRA realized that a lot of Canadians want free software. So what they've done is almost prioritize the various types of free software and, and you know, separated, you know, this, this is how you can file for free. These are the software products that cost, you know, from 10, 20, 30 dollars. Take your pick. Um, so Canadians now have greater choice than ever uh, because of the tools uh, to help them meet their tax obligations. So, you know, the CRA is in the, you'd swear I was from the CRA, I'm actually not. Uh, they're in the process of implementing, uh, I'll tell you why in a minute. They're in the process of implementing a new 2020 e-interactions strategy. And they have identified that partnership with industry is one of the key levers uh, in order to help them deliver upon these goals. 
So we're very excited about the kinds of innovations and experiences we can offer to taxpayers to help them improve their financial lives by leveraging more of the services provided by the CRA. And to take one example, if there was an API, so an API is the, the handshake between a software and the data being provided in our example. Um, to check the status of a taxpayer's refund, there's no reason why in the future you couldn't ask TurboTax on WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger when your refund will be deposited into your account. So you would know with certainty, oh, you know what, I can go buy that new flat screen next week once I get my biggest paycheck of the year. Um, now, this model is clearly not applicable, applicable to all functions of government, um, but it's a compelling concept for many departments to determine what areas of their mandate are core, where they need to focus, and what areas uh, where they can stimulate open innovation around you know, delivering better service to Canadians via the software industry or you know, whatever other you know, types of industries can provide the service on behalf of Canadians. Uh, in our case, it's, it's the tech software industry. So you know, government as a platform, as we've heard this morning, is, is a buzz, it's a buzz term uh, at a lot of conferences around Ottawa and just about every other you know, major capital. Um, but it's rare that people can point to concrete examples of it in the wild. You know, um, that are actually being used every day by, by Canadians. And you know, this year we've, we're watching our dashboards of Canadians who are actively using their TurboTax app on their phone and then they go home and they continue working on it after they get off the bus on, on their desktop. So we're seeing this crazy rise of people who just are so enthralled by, our, by filing taxes with TurboTax that they're doing it on the bus on the way home. Um, so I think the CRA really deserves a lot of credit uh, for pioneering this approach. You know, like I've worked in the Ottawa machine. We don't always see ourselves as pioneers, but in this case, our tax agency is really at the avant-garde. Um, for other departments and agencies, considering this idea, I would offer the following sort of uh, come to data ev evangelism. So, you know, first, uh, focus on collaboration, not competition, and determine the core functions that you must uh, you must do, and 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 then so that you can in enable innovation elsewhere. So, for example, at CRA, only the CRA can do audit, um, but we can do tax prep. Second, focus on data and services. So, how can you open up data and APIs? to enable developers to integrate your offerings into their software and simplify the lives of Canadians. And finally, reach out and engage uh, with developers. For example, the CRA holds uh, two developers conferences every year where they get feedback from, from our industry on how we think they're doing, and they provide us feedback on what their priorities and goals are so that we can work that into our business strategy. So, with that, I'll, I'll hand it back over to Tim. Thank you, Rodney. So, we have got about 10 minutes for questions, and I apologize, uh, we might be able to stretch it out. I've got some um, leverage here. Uh, I'll just keep talking. Uh, so, that was great, some great examples. Um, I'm gonna ask people to go right to the mics right away if you have questions. Uh, it's gonna be a bit of a lightning round, so, uh, just ask yes, no questions. But uh, uh, I'm gonna start with a cultural question, which is uh, often in Ottawa, uh, I used to have a, a, a boss who was former clerk of the Privy Council who used to joke, you know, that, that works in practice, but what about in theory? Uh, so uh, you, you end up with uh, just amazing amount of resistance to change. Uh, when, you know, there's multi-jurisdictional examples, getting people onto the program. But Rodney, you did sound like you're from CRA because it sounds like they really have come around, they have. So I'll start with you in terms of your experience and then come down to the more macro and international examples. Um, so what's the question? The, the, just in terms of cultural resistance within the organization to these sorts of changes. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think part of, the pr part of the problem that was articulated to us by the half of the CRA that we work with, which is the processing division, which was, you know, our, our 
the other side, the IT side, they're not convinced that it's, it's a safe thing to do or that it's worthwhile investing in. And so th they've really said, like, you guys got to come in and, and help convince our other side of the business that there are major efficiencies to be had here. And, you know, a great example is 15 years ago, Microsoft invested $500 million to try and build a tax software product. And halfway through the tax season, they shut it down. And the reason was they are not used to working in a minutes and hours environment where <clears throat> every year we go through this mammoth build to build TurboTax based on the 10,000 or so tax changes. And you know, Microsoft has the luxury, as we all know, of just delaying a product by a year or two, um, where in the tax world, Canadians want to use that product on time. You know, you all you have a month left, by the way. You know, that's the world we're working in, and we need to be ready with our product on February 15th. Um, so I think, I think the agency, part of the challenge was that, you know, like uh, Minister Bryson said, there's, there's silos even within a department. And so what one side of the department realizes is a chance for us to deliver better service and bring down our overhead, the other side may not even know that that's possible. It's also the importance of trust in terms of you know, people's personal data, their financial data. That's hugely important as well in terms of the mix. But Kevin, uh, cultural change. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. I, 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 so I'm from the government. Um, and so I, I would actually say the, the, the differences are not as big as one might think. Um, but uh, I, I think the key is to, to try it out, right? It's being, being willing to experiment. Um, I don't think anybody kind of knows where all this is going, right? Like even even you know, companies you know, like ours, we, we don't know what the future looks like, but we're willing to take the risks. Um, and, and I think government should, should, should consider that as well. Um, and, and I think at the end of the day, we are here to, to be helpful um, you know, on that journey. And so if you like, like the ideas, great. If you don't like the ideas, then don't use them. Um, but we do want to be, uh, be helpful and, and try to think about innovative ways to do this right. So I think it's just, it just comes down to an attitude and a willingness to, to engage. Yeah. Excellent. Edwin. I would say two things. One is creating this culture that allows risk-taking. And there's a story about how Mayor Bloomberg, when he was the mayor of New York City, he said, if there's someone who tries something new and fails, let me know and I'll take him out to lunch or her out to lunch. And so this idea that it does not kill you if you fail, that's a really new idea for government. Uh, and so having that political uh, acceptance of risk taking and failure, I think that's the first thing. The second is we really need to think about how we do performance management within the public sector. So much of performance management has taken us sort of down into very narrow uh, uh, measures which reinforce silos. And if we can't bring that back to what are the overall societal objectives that were here that brought us into this public service in the first place, we're not going to be able to get people to think outside of the box and outside of their stovepipes. Did I see Rodney signaling as well? No, I was just going to say on, on the idea of trust, you know, a lot of you may be thinking, well, how does, how does the CRA trust us with Canadians' data? <laughs> and, you know, the fact is they set the bar. So they work with us to, say, to, to learn from our industry what are the world-class standards we should be deploying. And then they say, the bar is this, and every year when we develop our software, we have to get over that threshold through security and fraud measures. So in many, in many cases when it comes to ensuring that the Canadian's data is secure, the government has that in their, in their tool belt, um, at, at least in the example of our industry. Yeah. Just very quickly, I mean, I, just to speak about the cultural thing, I mean, at Facebook we have this, we, we're, ton, we're full of slogans and stuff. One of them, one, one of the big ones is fail fast and fail harder. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we, we celebrate failure. I've um, not seen that in the public service of Canada. Well, you know, it's, it's not a bad thing. People fail all the time, right? So it's good yeah. to bring it out in the open, so it's There's okay. There's a lot of downside risk to failure in public service. That's my impression. So that, that's the culture that we have to change. We have a question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jatman Bajaj. Uh, I'm representing the Global Shapers community today, which is an initiative of the World Economic Forum. Uh, I'm also a technology entrepreneur, and uh, I'll, I'll root my question in a uh, public policy decision that we as Canadians made not long ago, which was the elimination of the long-form census and the data gaps that they, that may have created. Uh, and Rodney, you began touching on this idea of data. Um, and it came up in the Twitter discussion as well, so I figured it was worth bringing up now, which is, uh, and aside from what concerns consumers have, this is, that's not the question, but more of a practical question and a legitimate kind of direct question about what are private enterprises doing with the aggregate data outside of, you know, having a policy 
uh, you know, uh, aggregation of policy data. What else are in institutions like Facebook and Intuit doing? And then Edwin, if you wouldn't mind commenting a little bit on, should there be trepidation from governments in the involvement of large organizations? Because there's really no, there's no bones about who owns that data, right? Facebook makes it very clear, I'm sure Intuit does the same thing, about who owns the data on these platforms. Uh, so, so what happens, uh, should there be trepidation from, from governments in, in so far as the ownership of that data and what happens to it? after it's been gathered. Thank so you. Who, uh, you want to start, Kevin? Sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. I, I'm not really sure what the answer is, about who, I mean, I know the answer, but I'm not sure what the answer you think is in terms of who owns the data. The, the answer is you own the data, um, and um, you're free to delete it, remove it, do whatever you want with it at any time. Um, you know, but, but I would say, you know, just in terms of like, who, and, and so I guess the crawler to that is like, so, so where's all the stuff, like what other stuff is happening with the data? I think the answer, or I, I know the answer is uh, nothing is happening with the data beyond sort of, you know, the advertising, right? That happens on Facebook, and that's kind of, you know, I think people understand that there's advertising on Facebook. Um, but that's kind of it. Um, and I sit on, like, I'm on the global policy team, so we actually have these conversations every week globally about how we think about public policy issues. Um, and we also have a privacy meeting um, every week where we think through new products and services that are coming down the pike and thinking through what are the implications um, from, a, from a privacy and data, data protection standpoint. And, and in all cases, um, you know, we have a very robust uh, privacy uh, process where we kind of put, put it through the ringer to make sure that it, it does actually respect um, that, that point. So I, I feel very confident um, to be able to say that. Obviously, we have a great relationship with the Privacy Commissioner's Office. We brief them on a regular basis on all of our new products, um, and, and they're aware of, of sort of how this is done. So I just want to be very clear, like, you know, nothing uh, is being used, uh, it's not being sold to like third parties or whatever it is, it's, um, you know, it kind of stays within Facebook, and if you choose to take it out, uh, it's yours, and you delete it, do whatever you want with it. Bernie, anything to add, or Edwin? Edwin? I would say um, informed consent, risk management, transparency. So a lot of that data, there's really nothing bad that's going to happen with it. We need to have an ecosystem to make that data useful. That said, governments do have an important responsibility to look at what data can be misused and to take the appropriate measures to, to protect it. The other thing, I, I guess, is, you know, I, I just recently joined Instagram. Do not look at my account. <laughs> and uh, it's really boring. Um, that said, I mean, we're going into a culture where people share every aspect of their lives online. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 to me, it's, it's less and less important as an issue. But uh, from Twitter, at Nick Charney, third-party software between government and citizens is a key governance issue. Corporate interests do not always align with public interests. Thoughts? I think that's shortened because of a you know, limited number of characters. I, I would disagree with the premise of the question. I think uh, our industry could not exist unless we aligned with what consumers, and in our case, taxpayers, mm -hmm. yeah. want. And so, you know, when I gave that example of, you know, your you moved last year, and we were able to identify in your financial records that that's a tax um, write-off. That's what, that's what people are expecting. They do not want to have to fill out forms and guess whether they've gotten all of their um, uh, tax deductions for the year. There's a lot, what we call FUD in our business, which is frustration, uncertainty, and doubt, is the FUD underlies most people's tax return experience. And People want certainty, and the way that we can provide certainty is with greater access to their data. And much like Kevin said, you know, at, at any point that if someone wants to withdraw our access to their data, that's fine. You know, that they, they can go back to, you know, delinking their financial information and delinking um, all the different services that can come together to provide a picture to our product at the end of the year. Um, I, I just, you know, saying this is not just for Facebook, I think for many of these companies, um, you know, the, the orientation has always been about sort of changing the world, right? So our mission is to connect um, everybody um, in the world, and we think that's actually important. Um, and so I, I don't know, I mean, this sort of corporate versus public, I mean, you know, it, it, it's, it's a little bit, um, I mean, I, the, the book isn't written yet, but, but I do think it's a little bit old school. Like, I, I think increasingly, when, when I'm blown away every time I, I, I go with one of our marketers, you know, to these client meetings on the private side, private sector side, and they're talking about like, hey, you know how like everybody, you know, like loves to like, spend a lot of money to put ads on Super Bowl. Uh, and then they say, hey, you know, like um, we deliver, like so Facebook delivers a Super Bowl every day in Canada. That's crazy or like around the world, that, 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 that's, like a, that's, a, that's a crazy idea. And so I, I, I think where the value is, um, you know, as a former public servant, I think the, the appeal is like, man, you, if you want to reach Canadians, 
um, you can go and try to build something and hope that people will come to it, or you can kind of fish where the fish are. Um, and this is just an incredibly powerful um, uh, opportunity uh, online uh, with these platforms where you can actually engage with citizens uh, when they, where they are and where they want to be engaged. There are two people at the mics, and they, they have, I'm sure they're going to promise to ask very quick questions. So Dave, first to you, and then to Don. Okay. Uh, Dave Fraser from the uh, Information Communication Technology Portfolio at the National Research Council. Quick question for Kevin. So it's true, um, I own my data on Facebook, but Facebook, or any platform for that matter, owns the metadata. And ultimately, the metadata is what's really valuable. And I was really interested to read in the Economist piece that somebody referred to that actually authoritarian governments are those that are investing the most in internet expansion because they realize the potential uh, to, you know, control. So um, isn't that an issue? Turkey. Uh, yeah, and I think that's uh, why we're not in certain countries. Um, and I think you know, the broader point is uh, we, uh, we, have, we, we comply with local law, um, but I think that we also have a global set of community standards. And I think where, you know, where the government of, of a particular uh, you know, market asks us to do things that are contrary to community standards, um, that is a, you know, it's like a challenging thing. Uh, but I agree, I mean, these are hard issues. Um, but um, yeah, I think, I think over the arc of time, I think where we stand is to connect people and allow them to actually share what they want with each other. Thanks, Dave. Uh, last question, Don. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what my question is, so maybe someone can figure it out. But, but I did want to make a comment and then maybe uh, someone like Perhaps uh, uh, Edwin could, could comment on it. I like the CRA example because I think it really challenges us at the core of this idea of open dialogue inside government. And the big challenge there really is going to be around data that's uh, hosted and, and ultimately we look to government to be the trustee of that data. On the other hand, we want good services. And I think you're, you're absolutely right uh, that a lot of those services can and will be provided by the private sector and should be. But this will only work if there's a, a much more uh, I hate to use the word intimate, but intimate relationship between industry on one hand and government on the other on the management of that, 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 that data. And I guess my, my, I don't know what my question is. My challenge is how do we get that collaborative discussion in an ongoing way going? Because that's the only way we're going to manage that relationship on an ongoing basis so that we can constantly go a little bit this way, a little bit that way, and make Canadians feel like they're confident that their data is being respected at the same time they're getting the quality of services they want. There was, that was a statement, not a question. <laughs> d d does anybody want to try to make a question out of it and answer it? I, actually, I, I think that there's, there's an important point in what Don is saying, is how do we get governments to be ready for this new challenge of greater collaboration with the private and nonprofit sectors? And that means a complete change in the skill set of the civil servants and how we get that, what profile do we want, and what mix of civil servants. So in a way, and this is what we were talking about earlier, that. Uh, open government has very deep implications for how government functions. So maybe what we need to be talking about is also an open civil service. How do we get that bigger mix of people coming in and out, having those experiences so that they have the comfort level and the skills? Excellent. Kevin? Yeah, I, I completely agree um, with that point. I mean, you know, Minister Bryson talked about that. It's interesting. And, and actually, some of these tools have existed, right? Tim and I were kind of joking about it. Like, for many, many years, you have these interchanges, you have leaves of absence and things like that. Um, but, but I kind of feel like, yeah, we should, we should get more civil servants working in places like Facebook. Um, and we should probably get some people at Facebook and Google and into it and, you know, all these other places working in the government. I mean, some of it is just sort of cultural, sort of just bringing parts of that culture into an organization, demystifying some of the stuff and saying, well, actually, it's not really like that. Um, I think that would go a long way. So you're accepting applications, is that right? Yes, sir. So, <laughs> please see, Kevin. So at that, I'm going to, th oh, oh Rodney, sorry. I'll sorry. just be the contrarian voice yep. slightly. Please. Um, you know, the fact is, the public service doesn't necessarily need to, in all cases, have the same capacity that we have at you know, a Silicon Valley company. And the point would be, you know, um, our discussions right now with the CRA, th their IT department knows how to do APIs and provide access. Um, but they don't know how to develop the software. And so, in our example, they are actually quite well equipped um, to provide greater access as they incrementally ensure that the, the right walls are built around it. 
And so it's not always a case of, wow, our public service just doesn't have this um, cutting edge capacity. In many cases, they do. You know, the, the technological savvy of, of something so critical as our, um, our CRA, you know, they, they have world class talent there, um, but we're able to deliver upon it. On that, I'm going to close and thank the panel very much.